You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Nothing made President Calvin Coolidge happier than when he looked out his office window and saw his son, Calvin Jr., on the tennis court at the White House. Cal Coolidge Jr. was his father's favorite son. Even his other son, John, knew it. And so it was pretty normal when on the afternoon of June 30th, 1924, Calvin Jr., his older brother John, played several sets of tennis with the two White House doctors. And they played again. And they agreed to play more the next day. But Calvin Jr. would not show up for that match. He was in bed. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Okay, before we begin, a couple of things. Help support the program. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts if you're listening there. Write a review on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, CastBox podcast attic wherever you're listening particularly apple podcast is a good one to show your support for the show follow us on twitter at my hist m-y-h-i-s-t and if you're so inclined we have a patreon patreon.com slash m-h-c-b-u-y-p where you can financially support the program pretty clear now that one of the issues was simply this. Calvin Jr. had not worn socks when he played tennis, and he developed a blister in one of its toes. And that blister got infected, and a very common bacteria went from his skin into the bloodstream and resulted in sepsis. They sought out the opinions of doctors. They confirmed the diagnosis with laboratory tests. And Calvin Jr. went to get the best medical care at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. But this is 1924. And the best way to prevent a problem, an infection, is to not have it happen in the first place. He was 16 years old. Coolidge tried to fulfill his duties while worrying about his son. And the president seemed to be in shock, going from the White House to Calvin Jr.'s sickbed. July 4th, 1924. It was the nation's 148th birthday. President Coolidge's 52nd birthday. There's no celebration. Calvin is very sick, the president wrote. So this is not a happy day for me. Of course, he has all that medical science can give him. But he may have a long sickness. Then again, it might be better in a few days. That's how little medical knowledge was. And the difficult thing about this time period we're talking about, it is four years from the discovery of penicillin and really 16 years from penicillin being available in any way beyond research. It was soon clear that despite the hopes of the president, Cal Jr. was not getting better. President Coolidge repeatedly pressed a locket into his son's hand till he fell into a coma and could no longer grip it. It contained a photograph of the president's mother and a lock of her hair. When President Coolidge was 12, Victoria Coolidge, then 39, died of tuberculosis at their house in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Mother wants to see you before she dies, his father, John Coolidge, said. 
brought in also Calvin Coolidge's younger sister, Abby. And his father simply said, hurry now, and remember, no crying. Not now, Calvin. You're almost a man. Calvin Coolidge would write in his own autobiography, the greatest grief that can come to a boy came to me. Life was never to seem the same again. His mother died, and five years later, Abby, his sister, whom Calvin was especially close to, also died, probably of appendicitis. There was little that the Coolidge's could do with the medicine of that day. Calvin Coolidge Jr. died. Coolidge would wear a black armband for weeks. One friend of the president finds him sobbing at his desk, muttering, I just can't believe what has happened. I just can't believe what has happened. True tragedy. And the the words of Coolidge himself later, he didn't he didn't shy away from mentioning it. And he wrote it up in a way that it, it's hard not to tear up just reading his words about it. That's David Priest. And David Priest is the author of How to Get Rid of a President, History's Guide to Removing Unpopular, Unable, or Unfit Chief Executives. No one got rid of Calvin Coolidge. No one would have thought of it. But as Priest discusses in his book, Calvin Coolidge met certain conditions that really made him unable, perhaps make him unable to do his job for at least a few months, and it may have had a larger impact on his presidency. It struck him deeply, and although there's some historical disagreement about how much it affected his presidency, and I think reasonable people can disagree on that, uh, it certainly seems to affected, have affected him personally quite deeply and had at least some effect on the way he governed after that. Priest is publisher of Lawfare, chief operating officer of the Lawfare Institute, and co-host of the Chatter Podcast. He also works as a visiting professor at George Mason University. He's also a big fan of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. He's been on the show now. This is his fourth. Oh, that might be a record. And look, he wasn't he wasn't the first president to, to lose a family member uh, while in office. Other, others have too. Abraham Lincoln perhaps being the most famous because it happened during the Civil War. Uh, but for Calvin Coolidge, when, as you mentioned, he is lesser known, he's not in that pantheon like a Lincoln, uh, people will just resort to the stories about Coolidge giving little witty answers to the press and running the, the 1920s economy, and they brush over the fact that there is a, a real tragic human story here. The Democrats were meeting in New York City for a convention that would last 104 ballots and take more than a week to pick a candidate to run against him. The Democratic convention is stopped, and there is a moment of silence for the president's son. For Calvin Coolidge, it would be a break in the entire political campaign. He wouldn't participate in much of it at all. And it's unclear to me, this is where I, I don't feel knowledgeable enough about Coolidge to say definitively, but I'm not sure that he would have been an active campaigner anyway. Um, now, the, the trend had gone that direction. As you've talked about many times, the, the role of a presidential candidate in campaigning changed dramatically from the mid-19th century to the late 19th century and then into the 20th century, such that you had presidents by the time that Coolidge was running in the 1920s. You, you had candidates running political campaigns and traveling and giving political speeches and all of that stuff. The, the funny thing about Coolidge's run to remain in the White House for a full term was that he basically refused all that. He, he stepped back from an active political campaign. He gave a few speeches, but the speeches were about things like good sportsmanship and what it means to be a Boy Scout, and the price of labor it was probably closest in, in that way to a political campaign some 30 years in the past, which was William McKinley's famous front porch campaign back in 1896. Uh, McKinley, at least in his front porch campaign speeches, though, did deal with political issues, but Coolidge didn't even do that. Uh, it's, a, it's a funny thing, Bruce, because I don't I don't know what's the cause and what's the effect here. Uh, I think his son's death had something to do with that. 
he he wrote that the power and glory of the presidency went with him when when the son died and that certainly would have affected his his energy for the for the campaign but it also helped that he had a vice president who who was an active campaigner uh Charles Dawes was uh, energetic and was out there giving something like a hundred speeches in a few months and traveling over a thousand miles to campaign actively. And it's possible that that gave Coolidge with a political lead going into the reelection. Anyway, it gave him the excuse to sit back just as much as the mourning for his son did. Coolidge has changed. Price wrote, henceforth alternating between inaction in many areas of life and enthusiastic, almost manic concentration on details of fiscal policy. He slept as many as 11 hours overnight on top of regular afternoon naps. Never much of an exerciser to begin with. He exerted himself even less. It sure seems like it did affect him in some ways. And here I rely largely on the wonderful book, if you can get your hands on a copy, by Edmund Starling, his uh, former Secret Service agent, who wrote one of the books that was popular for several decades, where former butlers and Secret Service agents would would write books telling all about the presidents that they served. And in this case, Starling, I think, covered the period roughly from Woodrow Wilson through FDR. And he writes quite a bit about Coolidge. And Starling mentions that Coolidge was never much of an exerciser anyway, but that he exerted himself even less late in this term. Uh, he even described all of his physical tendencies, uh, in the words of Starling, being toward inertia. He instructed members of Congress to determine its own legislative agenda, he'd tell members they were closer to the people. His approach to foreign affairs was similar. You settle the problem. I'll back you up. Definitely you had this lethargy, which is not an uncommon uh, symptom of of depression in a case like this. Grace Coolidge said that her husband had lost his zest for living, and the chief usher of the White House described him as highly disturbed. You couldn't couldn't get Coolidge up and moving to do anything. He finally had to resort to getting him to ride an electric horse that had been sent to the White House, and that was. And I, I got to talk about that electric horse a bit, but I'm uh, so curious about it because yeah. I've, I've never seen a picture of it. I'm sure one exists, but I just find it so something jarring. like uh, we think an urban cowboy here. Yeah. You know, to picture Calvin Coolidge in, in the typical pictures, very buttoned up. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, all about his balance sheets and his financial matters and fiscal policy. And then to see him riding an elect an electric horse. That's just yeah. an image that's almost uh, too strange for fiction. Yeah, I mean, he was a witty guy, although I imagine after this event, uh, he was witty with the two sons. And I imagine after this event, uh, that mm. some of that changed, too. I, I go also to Coolidge's words himself. Coolidge did say after the death, he said when he looked out on the window out to the White House lawn into the tennis court where his son had it's essentially cut his toe, which led to the infection, which led to the, the blood infection. Um, when he looked out that window, Coolidge later wrote, I always see my son playing tennis out there. And he said, I do not know why such a price was exacted for occupying the White House. Somebody who, who feels that and says that, it's hard to imagine that that did not have an effect on daily working habits. I mean, without getting too much into religion, I have to throw in the we, we, the um, extreme Protestant um, responsibility, sense of yep. personal sense responsibility. Of right. When right. he's saying things like, "Why did this? Why did this punishment happen to me for taking this office?" But they are very very religious people and very simple people that you are responsible. You know, don't waste, don't do anything extravagant, and this kind of responsibility. I almost feel that um, the closest you get is Franklin Pierce, who loses his child right at the inauguration or right, traveling down there. And and if he didn't blame himself, his wife sure did blame Franklin Pierce for that. And it adds another level on top of any mental anguish that anyone might feel. There's this additional um, uh, personal responsibility for it. Yeah, I... 
I believe I, I have a dim recollection and this is something we could look up, but I'll put it out there and people can tell me if I'm wrong. I, I want to say he went to a Baptist school, but, I, but I'm not sure that he was a Baptist. I think he was exposed to several different denominations. Um, the one thing that I am fairly certain of is that he was not a Calvinist because it would just be too rich to have Calvin Coolidge be a Calvinist. Um, that would just be something that would probably stick in our memory had it been true. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm reading real quick here is there's just a variety of um, church might have, you know, such a small uh, mm -hmm. town that there might have been a church with multiple services, grew up uh -huh. with Baptist, Methodist, Congregationalist. But you're talking about very strict. But in one area, Priest notes in his book, he could focus on an occasional theater or fishing trip provided the little joy that Coolidge appeared to still have. Apart from putting his head down to focus on nuances of tax rates and debt reduction. One suspects Coolidge wasn't joking when he telegraphed word in late 1924 that at times I dream of balance sheets and sinking funds and deficits and tax rates and all the rest. Such dreams must have offered relief from other visions he endured daily. Calvin Jr. was his favorite son, but that doesn't mean he was easy on him. Calvin Coolidge could be a tough taskmaster. He once wrote to his son John, who was at Amherst College, where he was attending, and he expected him to work rather than dallying in nearby Northampton, the home of Smith College for Women. I want you to keep in mind that you have been sent to college to work. Nothing else will do you any good. Once when John was visiting the White House, he mentioned at breakfast that he would not be dressing formally for dinner because he would be going to a tea dance that evening. His father was silent for a minute and then said, you will remember that you are dining at the table of the President of the United States, and you will present yourself at the appointed hour, properly clothed. But he could also be instructive and tasking in a more humorous and witty way. One time when he was walking by a bank with Calvin Jr. and John, he said, Boys, listen here for a minute, and maybe you can hear your money working for you. Coolidge displays all 10 symptoms listed by the American Psychiatric Association as evidence of major depression. Other than resting, there was limited help at the time or acknowledgement at the time for this. When we think about Calvin Coolidge at all, we're thinking about, oh, this, this is the guy that said America's business is the business, is business, right? Pro-business president, didn't do too much about stock market speculation, and was, the, was particularly silent. He's a really good radio president. He had a great connection with people. He didn't do well in speeches. He was great on the radio. And I think we can also add that, uh, that he suffered from a problem that many Americans did and do and suffered a lot of great tragedy in life. He was not a you know two-dimensional person by any means. We talked to David Priest about this. Now, he didn't stop doing the job entirely, but frankly, that's, that's not how depression works. I remember coming across this journal article from a medical journal. I believe it was the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease back from 2006. And there was a triumvirate of scholars who looked at the biographical sources available regarding U.S. presidents and possible mental illness all the way from the late 18th century up into the 1970s. And that's hard to do because, you know, sources aren't great about things like this. And there's a lot of assumptions that that absolutely need to be made. But they actually found in, in their in their look at the symptoms from these secondary sources, they found that there were quite a few presidents, perhaps more than a quarter of all presidents met some established criteria for one or more psychiatric disorders with depression by far standing out as the most common. And yet we don't have story after story of presidents simply neglecting the job. That's not that's not how depression works. They still can get the job done. But was Coolidge a different person in his own mind after the death of his son? It certainly seems like it. Yeah, it seems likely things like like delegating a lot to of the making of law to Congress, although still very, as we discussed earlier, just with campaigning, still very 
common for presidents. Taft was doing a lot of that. Like, well, mm-hmm. let me let me see the legislation when it's done. Now, presidents now know that's that's a big mistake. Tag Taft got bit um, terribly with it on the tariff bills. But the point you make is is important, I think, and to our modern view of this, because this is like looking at two things that are um, changing over time and in interpretation at the same time throughout history. One is our knowledge or attention to the, these aspects of Coolidge's presidency that might have been obscured. And then the second is our awareness and how we interpret um, mental health and depression. And um, I almost think that, well, if it wasn't talked about a lot at the time, it's because it would have come with a real negative stigma. Like, right. And then right. even in modern times, you know, exactly. even even in relatively 80s or 90s, I could see it coming with questions of why didn't he step down? Why didn't Dawes take over? And now I think there's a, especially given what you just said, um, it, it seems like, well, you know what? <laughs> there might even be something about the condition that is helps with a very unique job, the presidency, where basically I think – a lot of people might just uh, not be able to handle it. You you almost have to have some kind of um, different um, different um, uh, mentality uh, in order to handle a job where everyone's coming at you, everyone needs your decision immediately. And I guess a simple way to say it is we seem to think that Lincoln had some of this condition, a kind of melancholy. They might have described it back then. Mm-hmm. There's no president that ranks higher. Mm-hmm. That's that's the interesting part to me, Bruce, is in Lincoln's case, he had, uh, according to contemporary sources from Joshua Speed, from his own accounts, he had what would be categorized today as severe depression at several points in his life. And when his son died in the White House, he basically you know, was inconsolable for days. And this is during a, a war. Now, the war went on and, and and things continued and he did recover. But was he disabled under some definition of that term for that period of time? Absolutely. Uh, two things were different, of course. One is the speed of decision making. And the speed of decision making now is is so much faster on so many fronts than it was then. Even during the Civil War, when Lincoln famously deferred to the generals on military matters, the big political questions did did not need an answer on any given day in that time period when he was when he was so down. Um, the other factor, of course, is that there was no Twenty Fifth Amendment. So if you had a president who declared himself unable to serve. Uh, since there was no mechanism for anybody else to so declare until the 25th Amendment. So if a president decided that he was unable to serve, he could hand power to the vice president. The Constitution made clear the vice president would take over in the event of disability. But there was no mechanism to get it back. There was no mechanism for the vice president to say, oh, the former president is now okay, so I'm going to hand power back. So it would have to be either an informal understanding or it would have to be something that was done extra constitutionally. And for that reason, as you've talked about here on the show as well, when Woodrow Wilson had his massive stroke, there was no real effort to get Thomas Marshall put in as president, even though Wilson was clearly unable to function because there was no mechanism for doing so and ensuring that if the president was well again, uh, that he would be president again. So I totally understand that both for Lincoln and for Coolidge, the death of their son, the severe depression that happened that impacted to one degree or another their work ethic and their work uh, productivity. I can understand why this did not lead them to to hand over power at the time. Yeah, no, totally understood. And uh, I mean, yeah, Thomas Marshall, I, you know, at least his own biography says I never wanted the place. Right. Um, I think that uh, ill suited for. The presidency, perhaps nice guy, mm-hmm. uh, did the did the vice presidency about as good as a, as, as anybody could, but uh, that that therein lies 
probably some of the reasoning. I had a lot of ticket splitting and ticket mm-hmm. healing at convention. So convention picked vice presidents don't make good people to say, I'm doing a colonoscopy, you know, take over because they're usually from totally different factions of the party, you know, where you have um, um, your gores and your um, your your even your pences to some extent, you know, they're coming from ideologically a similar place. I would still find it very strange and difficult. I hope we'll get to a point where a president can say, I just need five days here. You right. take over. We're still not there. It's only been the colonoscopies. Yeah, so, we're not we're not there, but I think that the the seal has been broken somewhat by first Ronald Reagan uh doing his procedure and invoking the twenty fifth amendment so that George H. W. Bush was was acting president for, for hours. Um, that allowed George W. Bush in June 2002, and again, I think in July of 2007, uh, twice George W. Bush had medical procedures and handed the powers and duties of the presidency over to Vice President Dick Cheney. And these are momentous things. It, it had only happened once before in American history that there had been this temporary transfer under the 25th Amendment. Yet when George W. Bush did that the first time, and especially the second time he did that, there was not much attention to it. It was interesting, but it was less interesting each time. So with that seal broken, I think we are closer to a time where a president can actually say, you know what, for a medical procedure, uh, as Joe Biden did briefly uh, earlier in his term, you can actually have a temporary declaration of disability and the president takes the powers back, uh, when, when he feels up to it again. And that being only for medical procedures is the norm now, but that was a new norm that, that didn't happen before. And I could see that being expanded to other reasons should events warrant. Hello everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the history of the second world war podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. On August 27, 1928, 15 nations signed the kellogg briand Pact. And what it does, essentially, is end war. Signatories included France, the United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Belgium, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Italy, and Japan and an additional 47 nations will sign on later. It's signed by most of the established nations in the world. The U.S. Senate ratifies the agreement by a vote of 85 to 1. It is true that Kellogg-Briand did not bring an end to war. In fact, in 1931, when, when the Japanese invade Manchuria, The League of Nations, or any nation, the United States, is unable to take any action to enforce anything against Japan. It's seen as an accomplishment for the Coolidge administration and for Frank Kellogg, the Secretary of State. You know, therefore, it has to be seen in the light. And as we discussed with David, there's all kind of interpretations of Kellogg bringing like, why during the Coolidge administration, this kind of like straight cucumber guy is like passing this idealistic bill? Right. It seems more like Wilson or FDR or Kennedy or someone like that would do a bill like that. Not Coolidge, but there's all kind of interpretations. You have a real split. Either he did this because he was careless. That's kind of a silly bill. He did this because he was idealistic after his son's death or somewhere in between. He did this and he made some changes to it before he did like any president would. Yeah, it's it's easy to point to discrete events after the death of his son and and play that historical guessing game you know how much did it really affect his his view of the kellogg briand pact and the idea of outlawing war hard to say he did not 
he did not reveal much afterwards about his his deep inner thinking and how it may have changed because of that episode with his son. Nonetheless, he signs Kellogg Breon. I have to say that I don't think that Kellogg Breon is as weird or silly. You know, now we look at it as banning war. But one of the other things to consider is that it was also putting us, America, closer with the nations of Europe, which even though Harding and Coolidge in the 20s and the GOP in the 20s were running against Wilson's League of Nations, they wanted some type of relationship, too, with the world. They didn't want to be tagged politically as complete isolationists. And I suspect many in the GOP didn't want actually to be isolationists. Here's what um, Robert Sobel writes in his uh, biography of Coolidge. Towards the end of the summer, it appeared 15 countries that had been involved in the negotiations were prepared to sign and the ceremony to take place in Paris, but there remained some seemingly minor problems. Kellogg said he would not attend unless his counterparts in other countries did so as well. Senator Boer of Idaho, an isolationist, organized support for the pact skillfully. The fact that he did certainly helped. Coolidge lobbied for the measure, inviting doubtful senators to the White House for consultation, and Dawes helped where he could, noting the finer points of the pact, but also warning that a rejection would be a slap in the face for the president. Supporters of the pact also noted that this, this signing of the peace agreement, had to be seen simultaneous to a large-scale American military buildup. Now, this is a military buildup in the 1920s, which would not even resemble what we'd see later in the 1940s, and certainly not today. Coolidge, who had been lukewarm about the pact, was now a supporter. In his annual message, he says this, where the most important trees ever laid before the Senate will be that which the 15 nations signed in Paris. Foreign policy wasn't as important to Coolidge, but under his watch, America remained at peace and trade and foreign investment rose to new heights. So, again, I don't like to, there's some speculation that, oh, you know, because of the death of his son, he wasn't really focused and he allowed this you know, kooky Secretary of State to sign the silly pact about banning all war. It is true that maybe on the French side, the Briand was looking to get a Nobel Prize that actually he wouldn't get. Kellogg would get it. But um, on the American side, they were pretty straight about what they were doing here. Build up the defense, sign this agreement, get the other um, restrictions, because this would have some strict restrictions on on military buildup. And do both simultaneously. It made a lot of sense. It looked good and it helped support the, you know, it, it was an, a successful achievement seen at the time for the Coolidge administration, the type of things that presidents do, not something extraordinary or some silly gambit. One thing that is probably more traceable to the lingering effects of dealing with his son's death was that in early 1925, Coolidge nominated Charles Warren, uh, I think from Michigan, somewhere in the Midwest, to be attorney general. And the nomination was running up against some real opposition on the Hill. And Coolidge did not, Coolidge did not fight hard for the nomination. Coolidge basically just let it die. And in fact, Warren, his nomination was rejected by a couple of votes, which was the first time since Reconstruction this had happened. So what? This is something like 50 years that a presidential nomination had been had been rejected for the cabinet. Uh, that one, I think you can probably put put some weight on the fact that Coolidge just didn't feel up to fighting for it because he had been up to fighting for things that he felt strongly in before that. And this is a case where he simply didn't, and it led to something that was quite shocking at the time, which is the Senate rejecting a cabinet nominee. That didn't happen much. That one I place more weight on than the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which had a whole lot more going on and a whole lot more inputs than that. A simple 10-word statement. 
was issued on August 2nd, 1927. I do not choose to run for president in 1928. The nation's shocked. Coolidge doesn't explain. But in his autobiography, he said one thing. When he went, the power and the glory of the presidency went with him. He wasn't a very active former president either. He didn't meet with many members of Congress at some wood. He had clerks deliver his message. He would write a few letters attacking the New Deal. He was just 61 when he died of a heart attack in 1933. I feel I no longer fit in with these times, he wrote to a friend. Um, I read an article from Alan Schwartz, a professor of medicine, Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at Drexel University College of Medicine, who does indicate that uh, depression has been linked with cardiovascular disorders. They may not take prescribed medicines or they may use substances, drugs, alcohol, sleep poorly, not get enough exercise. But it also leads to chemical changes that could harm the heart. So I want to talk a bit about Calvin Coolidge, his presidency, what David and I have been discussing. And I think the context for this is that there's been a bit of a revaluation of Calvin Coolidge, and that's particularly coming from the conservative side, um, from historians of that ilk. And I think it's best to look at what they have to say and and put it in context and, and do it justice. Because Emily Shales, I think, is probably the historian that's really uh, on this the most, but there are others. And you have a couple of themes. One is, okay, he accomplished a lowering of the tax rate from where it was, a lowering of the budget deficit from where it was. No president would reduce the budget as much as he. Um, I've seen also the argument that he's the only president to limit the power of the presidency itself. Everyone else wanted to expand it. Okay, we'll take that in. That lynchings and Ku Klux Klan membership decreased during his presidency the kellogg Brion Pact that we already mentioned, tax reduction in his last year, and something else that I think if it was a different president, if it was FDR, it might get more attention. That's in 1924, the U.S. Congress passes the Indian Citizenship Act, which means that Native Americans are now citizens of the United States. Previously, uh, it had been if you served in the World War, They might have granted you citizenship if you were a woman married to a man who was not Native American. They might grant you citizenship, but not uniform. The Dawes Act really treated Native Americans as wards of the state, giving them allotments. So it was a move away from the concept of Indian nations, tribal nations that the government was negotiating with, um, which in and of itself had a lot of corruption there, who the government was deciding to recognize as Native American, to a very poor system of allotments, to a deprivation of Native American culture, to finally under Coolidge, the granting of citizenship. Uh, It did not, unfortunately, convey the right to vote that would come by the 40s because states controlled elections and still put limitations on. By the end of the 1940s, all states in the Union allowed Native Americans to vote. You know, but this bill passed during the Coolidge administration is going to pave the way for more improvements in the 1930s, a reorganization act, taking away some of the bad aspects of the Dawes plan. And just to give politicians a little fear of God, nothing like giving votes to people to give them influence over their lives. But again, I see it as something if that had passed during Franklin Roosevelt or Wilson You know, it's something you might have heard more about it. But Coolidge kind of gets, well, there was no action during his presidency. And that's true. But he did take actions. I mean, and even to our discussion of whether he was active or not, when you, his veto of the McNary bill, which his vice president even supported, and many Republicans supported McNary, was a Republican, future vice presidential candidate in the Republican Party, uh, to help farmers shows that he's very active in politics, but because that activity is perhaps in the negative form, in other words, not passing legislation was more of a priority for him, 
it doesn't get celebrated as much. And I think that's something that you need to acknowledge. Coolidge had, on several occasions, spoke supportively about African-Americans, particularly African-American veterans of the World War, spoke out against lynching. He was not able, and he would have wanted to, been able to pass an anti-lynching bill during his presidency. It was blocked in Congress. As authors have noted, Ku Klux Klan membership, lynchings, both go down during Coolidge's presidency. Here, I think, though, historians saying this are not able to connect the dots in terms of in, in terms of agency on the part of Coolidge. Did he cause that? And, and I don't think that that's directly the result of him. Um, the Ku Klux Klan membership was going down because it had, first of all, it had surged previously. And, you know, there's a little element of what goes up must come down. But also there were more attacks on this organization. I wouldn't say I believe that Coolidge could be rightly criticized for missing an opportunity in 1924 during that campaign for attacking the Klan, where his opponent, John W. Davis, did, where his vice president did, at least on a couple occasions. All of this is to say that uh, there wasn't any specific legislation to stop lynching, so there was cultural effects going on. Virginia passes a law during this time. Texas had already passed a law. Ohio had already passed a law. State laws are starting to crack down on illegal, unlawful lynchings. It's hard to attribute that to Coolidge. I think it's just a factor that happened in the culture during the time that he's president. But I also want to talk a bit, and and, and for someone that has you know some inklings, considering myself more in the left of things often, it is sometimes useful to at least hear out what people are saying, right? And not to just dismiss things out of hand. So when we hear some historians now saying one of the great things about Coolidge is that he was able to limit the power of the presidency and to sometimes do nothing when doing nothing was the right thing. And while I don't know if I completely agree, considering the enormity of the economic disaster that was about to happen, It's hard not to assign some level of blame for the president before because it happens in Hoover's first year. So was something going on that could have been seen, that could have been managed better? We don't know. And there was definitely those questions raised at the time. But I do think there's some merit behind the idea that being president isn't always about doing stuff. We just give the president a report card now. It's like weekly, like what did the president do? What did the president do? And, and we're so tied into seeing action from that White House that sometimes the power of the presidency is also in what you don't do. But certainly Silent Cal was popular for being Silent Cal, for being the way that he was during the time that he was in. He was not a zombie as a result of his condition. The vetoes show that his impact on legislation, on adding or subtracting things, show that he may not have been as super fastidious as he had been previous to that. Besides what we discussed here, anything else you think that's important on this topic? Yeah, and a couple of other Hmm. perhaps minor historical data points, but that's kind of what we obsess on, isn't it? Sure. So one was the fact that Coolidge, if nothing else, was was diligent with his personal matters, especially financial matters. He he was somebody who met obligations promptly as a matter of principle. And yet when he received the undertaker's bill for his son's death in July, uh, he ignored it for three whole months. And that's very uncharacteristic of him. Yes, that's a different kind of obligation. But the very fact that he would do this um, and he had never done something like that before is is interesting. The, the second one are the words of Charles Dawes himself. So at the time that his son uh, was very sick, the president did dine with his vice president and Dawes himself had had tragedy. His son had drowned in something like 1912 or 1913 when he was about 21 years old. So so he understood at some level 
what Coolidge was was struggling with with young Calvin's illness. But in Dawes' account later, he reported that at that dinner, that Coolidge had lost all interest in the conversation uh, uncharacteristically, and the the dinner ended early. And when he peeked into the door of Calvin's room, he saw the president bent over the bed, uh, in his words, with such a look of agony and despair on the president's face that he had never witnessed before. Now, Coolidge and Dawes weren't best friends or anything, but they did become closer after that uh, because they bonded, in a sense, over the tragedy. And to me, that's another sign that it, it must have affected Coolidge if at the time when the vice president wanted to talk with him about the reparations issue that Dawes was was taking the lead on in so many ways and later on winning, I believe, the Nobel Peace Prize for um, the fact that he didn't even want to talk to his vice president and couldn't carry on that conversation. It's it strains credulity to think that that could be true and those other bits of evidence we've already mentioned could be true. And then to say that it really didn't affect Coolidge's exercise of the powers and duties of the office. It, it seems to have had a deep effect on him. And um, the presidency wasn't in danger, at least as it existed at that time. Yeah, you bring it to the nuclear era. You bring it to, say, Kennedy and Khrushchev and where you don't just have political enemies in the Senate – which might be even more scary than the Russians, but you have the Russians, uh, you know, and they will, they are looking second to second to exploit things they know are going on. They're not, you know, you're, you're not friends. And, uh, those minute to minute problems, you know, might be, uh, seized upon by somebody like Khrushchev. Okay. Well, now I'm going to move over, uh, some troops over to Berlin. You know, I'm going to give you a particularly hard time in our summits and be obstinate because I know your condition. You know, so things like that didn't exist in the 20s. We just don't know the flip side. Uh, had there been a true crisis, had there been the equivalent of a Pearl Harbor attack uh, 20 years earlier or, or something else, would, would Coolidge have been roused um, and, and gained some energy back uh, quite Quite possibly, but but we don't know. Maybe it would have been a situation where that was literally impossible at the time. We we do know that it was on his mind, though. Um, the, that's the one thing is he was not shy about it. There's one story, Bruce. Maybe you know this one. I don't, but I've heard it for a long time, and I've never chased down the primary source about Coolidge. Was that uh, Coolidge was the one who started the tradition of having a national Christmas tree? And I had always heard that after his son's death, that because he didn't want to watch something else die in the White House, that he wanted the Christmas tree to be a living tree constantly tended by the gardening staff. That That's truthy. That is, it, it sounds right based on everything else, but I've never been able to confirm that. I just have that story that sticks in my head from a long time ago, probably some compendium of uh, Christmas and politics stories. And that's the one I remember is Coolidge having an issue because of his son's death with the idea of a, um, of a Christmas tree dying in front of him. I did try to track down that story that David was talking about, and I, you know, I just can't say conclusively yes or no, whether it's true that the reason that there is a, a live tree in the ceremonies is because of uh, Coolidge and his son. What we do know is that the first White House Christmas tree starts in 1923, and it's on the ellipse. The first tree came from the president's home state of Vermont, from Middlebury College, where it was donated from, which a group of alumni paid to have shipped by train to Washington. It's not just about Christmas spirit, this whole Christmas tree lighting thing. The Electric League of Washington, yes, there is a society boosting the use of electricity. They want to increase Americans' use of electricity. And one of the ways is Christmas trees lit by electric lights. They spent $5,000 to run underground electrical cables to the tree that's strung with bulbs. And there's a ceremony Christmas Eve, 1923. Thousands of people attend the ceremony. Coolidge hits the switch at the appointed moment and 2,500 red, green, and white bulbs light up the night sky in Washington, D.C. 
But there's no guarantee that we're going to do this again. So it's not like Coolidge is starting immediately something that uh, is going to happen again and again. And one of the things the president of the Electric Society says, he really wants Coolidge to do it again. He writes to his daughter, if you can get the president of the United States to do something two years in succession, he will always do it. And this is where, you know, I can't, I can't get a source on whether it's because of his son and he doesn't want anything dead in the White House or because he had criticized cutting Christmas trees as wasteful, Coolidge did. So how to persuade him, let's do a live tree. So they actually plant a Norway spruce near the White House and Coolidge presides over the event. They want him to speak. This is 1924. This is the year that his son died, and this is what he says. I accept this tree, and I will now light it. Nonetheless, a tradition was born. In 1925, the next year, they really want Coolidge to speak on the radio networks, and he doesn't. It's in 1928 when he says they'd once again do this Christmas tree ceremony, and he says to the American people listening on their radios, in token of the goodwill and happiness of the holiday season, and as an expression of the best wishes of the United States towards a community Christmas tree, in behalf of the city of Washington, I now turn on the current, which will illuminate this tree. Hey, we'll talk a bit about this podcast, this Chatter podcast. Oh, sure. So one of the things I do other than uh, enjoying, you know, talking to you about presidential history and writing books and things is I'm the publisher of, of Lawfare, which is a national security information and analysis website and family of podcasts. And we have a daily Lawfare podcast that addresses national security, law, policy issues, Um uh, but what Shane Harris of the Washington Post and I did recently is we decided to co-host a separate podcast called Chatter, in which we have one-on-one, -on -one, long-form conversations, they can go for hours, with people operating at the creative edges of national security. So we've talked to Adam Kinzinger about uh, ethics and values in politics. We've talked to former deputy... DNI or director of national intelligence, Sue Gordon, about the impact of sports when she grew up and how that affected her ability to be a leader and a manager within the intelligence community. Um, Shane has talked to one of the leading journalists investigating anomalous uh, aerial incidences. These, you know, so used to be called UFOs, but now that there's more public attention to them because of some releases from the Defense Department, you know, what are these things in the sky and what can we learn about them? Uh, all the way up to and including spy movies and poisons and just a whole range of things that are in that outer edge of national security. Uh, fascinating conversations with fascinating people. And it's called Chatter by Lawfare. We're on Twitter at That Was Chatter. And we actually have a couple of episodes uh, coming out this month uh, having to do with presidential history as well. So I think you'll be especially interested in those oh great yeah i gotta tell i will sign up i i do listen to a lot in addition to recording um well great well david thanks so much for coming on and talking to us today it's it's my pleasure bruce i always enjoy it we want to thank david priest for joining us today remember his book is how to get rid of a president by david priest p-r-i-e-s-s History's Guide to Removing Unpopular, Unable, or Unfit Chief Executives. There's a lot of history in that book. It sounds like a title that's just about, like, you know, uh, a small, narrow thing. But there's a lot of uh, presidential stories in that book that Priest has carefully researched. That's why we wanted to have him on today. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Check that out. We'll have some links up there on the website and also some links about Calvin Coolidge and photos there for you to see. <laughs>
Thanks for listening.